I'm here today to talk about animation. Uh, my name is Jason Schleifer. I'm one of the heads of character animation at DreamWorks. Just finished up working on Mr. Peabody and Sherman. How many of you have seen that? A few. How many of you are going to see it this weekend? That's <laughs> awesome. Cool. Um, I want to talk. Uh, awesome. Wow, it transitioned. Perfect. So I'm going to talk about the animation process for the film. Um, I have some stuff in here, a little bit about the production design, but both Kendall and Christoph have talked a lot about that, so I want to get through, and I know you have a lot of amazing questions. Uh, we were told that you guys were going to be very quiet, but you've been talking a lot and having awesome questions. I want to give an, enough time for that at the end of this. So I'll breeze through the production design stuff and then talk about how we actually make the animated picture. Before I get into it, though, I'm going to show a trailer, and uh, hopefully it'll stand up against the Dragons 2 trailer. <laughs> For Mr. Peabody, the only thing harder than being the world's most extraordinary dog. Is the president coming to dinner again? You'll see. The Petersons. Welcome to our happy home. He's being an ordinary dad. He hates me. Ugh, share your interests. Tell a witty anecdote. Make it work. But don't tell her about the way back. He calls it the way back. It's a time machine. Now that we've seen it, maybe we should go back. Nope. Sherman, Penny, why are you two dressed like ancient Greeks? I lost her in ancient Egypt. And I got engaged to King Tut. Then we ran out of gas. Nature Troy. You used the way back. Yeah, she was into it. Oh my. Now, oh dear, he's taking family time. You've used time travel improperly to another dimension. We must rewrite history in order to save the universe. <laughs> Ancient Egypt. Boy, your hand's cold, Mr. Peabody. Sherman, that's not my hand. Ah! Ah! That's disarming. Heroes of Greece. Yeah! Someone left this for us. A present. Nice. It looks just like our horse. Should I bring it inside? It'd be rude not to. No! Peabody here. Ah! <laughs> I did not see that coming. This much. How do you take off? You just pull down that lever. This one? Oh, boy. But if you close your eyes, it does it. The most amazing dog of all time. Hang on! Is leaving his mark. Ah! On history. Leonardo da Vinci. Mona Lisa. I am halfway done with the painting. She won't even smile. Perhaps I can be of assistance. Oh! Oh! Is everyone amused? Seems we've ripped a hole in the space-time continuum. Drop the saber and step away from the futuristic orb. I take off the house from no man. <laughs> take it easy, bro. DreamWorks, Mr. Peabody and Sherman. Why can't children be simple? Children are not the machines, Peabody. I tried to build one. It was creepy. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I love hearing you guys laugh. That is so fantastic. How many of you re uh, remember the show Mr. Peabody and Sherman from the late 50s? Oh, good, excellent. For those of you who don't, uh, Mr. Peabody and Sherman was a small five-minute segment on a TV show called Rocky and Bullwinkle. It came out in the late 50s, early 60s. And it's basically a story about a uh, dog who's the most interesting man in the world who happens to be a dog, uh, who adopts a little boy, Sherman, and builds a time machine so he can go back and teach him all about history. So it's you know very realistic, uh, very believable story. And what's fun about it is as we were getting started on the show, we were trying to figure out what sort of visual style did we want to go with the picture. The original series was done at a time where there was a lot of really great graphic quality in our design stuff. So you can notice this is some of the, uh, the environments that have been done. And everything is really flat. There's great line quality. It's super, super graphic and stylized. And we wanted to really try and replicate that as much as we could. We also looked a lot at what was happening in advertising and in other films at the time. And you could see a real tendency towards really great, funny looking perspectives and wax in terms of like how the geometry is laid out, flat colors, um, and sort of getting into this mid-century modern design, which was really interesting for us and exciting. So we started coming up with rules about how we were going to build things and how we were going to um, work with the different geometry in the world. This is a arched doorway using my laser pointer, yeah, arched. And that's you know, very even on all sides, and it looks very boring. So what we wanted to do is make sure that we could make things look a little bit more interesting and skew things like that. 
we made sure that all of our geometry was very hand-drawn looking, which is what it looks like in the original cartoon. We wanted to replicate that because we really liked the style. Um, we started using this idea of wonk, which is very similar to what was done in Madagascar, uh, but instead of just trying to wonk everything in the geometry, not that that's what Mad did, but that's what we initially started out with, was we were just sort of going crazy with everything. We realized that we needed to have some rules about how we did stuff, so we ended up wonking based on scale. So things that were really big, like this building, had very little sort of wonk and skewing to them, but stuff that was small, the wrong way, there we go, stuff that was small, like over on the right, is wonked quite a lot. So if you look at the geometry in the rooms, you'll notice, or in the, in the environments, you'll notice that small things are really skewed and look very hand-drawn and, and organic, whereas stuff that's bigger, like buildings, is a lot less. Like I said, I'm going to rush through this stuff so we can get into the character animation side, which is more of what I know about. Uh, we looked a lot at caricature in terms of our, our objects, making long things longer, skinny things skinnier, fat things fattier <laughs> as they go. Uh, we looked at exactly that, you know, like stretching out the length of the chairs, squashing down the legs, um, and even doing this with the characters. So Sherman and Mr. Peabody, for example, both have giant heads and little tiny bodies. Mr. Peabody himself, if you measure him based off of heads, his head, his body, and then his legs. So his, his entire body is basically like two and a quarter heads tall. So actually his head is bigger than his torso, which is fantastic. Like I love that type of proportion and trying to figure out how to make it work. And I'll talk about that in the animation side of things, is how we went about solving some of the challenges there. Um, actually, down at the bottom, you'll notice we have a broad range of sizes for our generics. Uh, normally, what we do in a production is we spend a lot of time up front building our hero characters. And then we try and make a couple of generics and then just change their colors and hair color and, and texture and clothing to try and in introduce variation and variety into our crowds. But in this case, we wanted to go really, really crazy and have a huge variety in terms of geometric shape, which was a nice challenge um, for a number of reasons. One is we have to clothe all those characters, because otherwise it would be a very disturbing movie if you see all these <laughs> naked men and women walking around New York City. Or it would just be a really fun weekend. Uh, so we had to clothe them, but they also had to exist in all these different time periods. So we had clothes for a whole bunch of different time periods, a whole bunch of different body styles, made a lot of work for our clothing uh, team which uh, luckily the guy who runs the clothing team is a very good friend of mine and he likes challenges like this. So we go, this is going to be impossible. And he's like, yes, awesome. You get the same budget. Cool, we'll figure that out. Uh, the other challenge with this, with the size of the characters is Peabody and Sherman over here are very, very small, but we didn't want to make the world around them miniature for them. So they're about yay tall. They live in an apartment in New York and you know, there's stairs and a kitchen and things like that. We had to make sure that everything in the apartment worked for Peabody and Sherman in terms of their scale, but when they had people coming over, like Patty and Paul, who are normal sized over here somewhere, uh, they need to be able to like walk up and down the stairs just like Peabody and Sherman can. So we had to figure out technically how to model something that would work for normal sized people and also for little sized people. We expanded the uh, geometric sort of wonking that we were doing also to our textures. And you can see like really, really cool stylized texture work for the, you know, for brick and for stone and stuff like that, which was awesome. But like I said, I want to talk more about the character side of things uh, because this was really what I was excited about with the project is I love the original film because of the difference between the two characters, the contrast between them. And I was really, really excited to figure out how we were going to do that in 3D and be able to have a father who's pretty intelligent and stiff and controlled have a son that is chaotic and crazy and full of energy. How we could show those two characters connecting and being a good father-son relationship as opposed to having it just be really awkward and uncomfortable. So I was really excited to try and explore that. So Mr. Peabody himself, talk about him first. He is, like I said, the, the most interesting man in the world. He is an astronaut, a physicist, a hunter, Indiana Jones, a teacher, um, whatever that is, <laughs> a snappy dresser, a, a playboy. Uh, you know, he can do everything and anything. And the challenge for us was how do you have a character like that that the audience is going to be able to empathize with and associate with? So we had to come up with ways to make him vulnerable so that you would be drawn into his character. And we did a few things, which I'll talk about throughout this. But 
The first thing we did was, uh, I wanted to mention these character designs. If I can go back, there we go. These are done by Craig Kelman, who also did the designs for Madagascar. And uh, he is awesome, we just love his work. Everything he draws is just like, <sighs> yay. Uh, so we wanted to translate this really great graphic 2D style into 3D. And what we've learned over the past few years, in the past few shows, is that when we're working on our scenes, we do previs which you guys have all seen and you all know about now is it's a way of visualizing the cinematography before we get in and do all of the animation and lighting and everything that's really expensive. And the previous process has been incredibly useful for us and amazing. So we wanted to do the same thing with our character rigs because normally what will happen is we'll build the models, we'll take them into the character rigging side. How many of you know what a character rigger does or what a character rig is? A few of you. Wow. How many of you are students of animation? How many of you are raising your hand with your right hand versus your left? Oh, two! Excellent! You win! This is for you later. <laughs> huh? um, so a character rigger is the person who basically takes an inanimate model, something that can't move, puts in all the joints and muscles and controls that allows the animator to move it. It's kind of like if you had a marionette, uh, uh, the person building the marionette, the one who would say, here is the puppet, here are the strings, here's the wood, that would be the character rigger, and then they would hand that to the animator, who's the puppeteer, who would then move it around and go hee. -hee. So that rigging process can take a very, very long time to get a film quality character rig up and going. Usually, in, in the past, it's taken 12 weeks, possibly, sometimes more for our hero characters. And if you go through that entire process and then find out that the proportions are wrong, you get to redo it all, which is wonderful, very fun. Not very economical, but a lot of fun. So we wanted to try this previs process on our character rigs to answer questions about proportions and about what sorts of controls we would need to have before we went in and did the full character rigging process. So very, very quickly, we got a model up of Mr. Peabody based off of the designs just to see what it would look like. And I just did a very, very quick animation of him walking just to see what happened. And we learned a lot. First thing we learned is that his muzzle is really long. Like, that's crazy. That's longer than his head. That would be, that's like if my head, well, my head is this high, but it's like, you know, it's almost lo as long as his torso right here. So if he, you know, if this existed in real life, he'd just be like all the time. Um, we also looked at the graphic quality of how his, his uh, belly went into his legs, which in the 2D drawings looked great, but we wanted to have a very clean line through his entire body. We wanted super clean movement through everything, and this, this just felt like it was getting cut off. So we realized that we had to make some adjustments. So because we didn't spend a lot of time working on our skinning technology and our deformations, we could look at this and immediately go in and say, all right, we're going to fix some things and change its proportions, and again, work with him just to see if we could make this feel a little bit more appealing to look at. And I think that we were successful with that, where we shortened his muzzle, we uh, worked on the line from the belly into the legs, um, we got his little butt moving, which was fun. <laughs> and then we also would show this to our director to see, you know, do you like the texture of movement here? Because that's one of the things that you're doing early on in, in a show, is there's so many possibilities. There's so many ways you can go, you don't really know which way to go yet. So you just sort of throw something up there, and you see how people respond to it. And then you react to that response, and then you throw something else up there. Sometimes they respond poorly, and you really throw up something there. Uh, so we looked at this, we thought, okay, cool, that's great. Another thing we wanted to do was, you know, answer the obvious question is Mr. Peabody is a dog, so does he move like a dog? Should we treat him like a dog? In the original TV show, he spends a lot of time as a quadruped walking around on all fours. He would sit on, sit on all fours like a dog. He also walks on his hind legs. So we had to figure out, do we want that? So I did a very quick test of taking the rig and trying to mash it around so that we can make him look like a quadruped, which was r rather difficult because the, the skeletal structure of a quadruped is very different from that of a biped. I don't know if any of you have noticed, but dogs and people, <laughs> you watch a dog walking on all, you know, it's awesome. Um, but it's not just the way the legs work, but also where the neck connects to the head. You know, on a, on a dog, it's connecting back here, and on most people, it's connecting under here. <laughs> so, you know, I did this quick test just to see what it would look like. And they like the test, they like the, the feel of it, but there's a real problem right in here. You can see there's a lot of pinching and bunching in the way that the thigh is connecting to the body. These are things that we could solve, but it would take us 
I don't know, maybe three, four weeks to figure out how to get that to look really, really good so that the legs would work great when he's standing and then also work great when he's as, as a quadruped. So we could do that, but we didn't know how often he was going to be like this. So we showed it to the director and, and asked him, we said, what do you think? Do, you, do we want to use our time to fix this? How many times are we going to see him as a quadruped? Turns out it's only going to be like once or twice. So we talked to our character effects team, which comes after animation, and they're the ones who sort of smooth out all the deformations that look bad. They'll deal with things like hand contact, clothing, hair, stuff like that. And it, took, it could only take them like a couple days to fix a problem on a shot where we have this. So we figured, okay, a couple days versus a couple weeks. We just won't spend the time getting it to look right in the rig. And when we go to a shot where he's a quadruped, they can fix it in the shot. And then we can use that time in development for something else. So it was a really great chance to throw that up and go, what are we going to do with it? Uh, after we went through this entire development process in pre-production, we ended up with our final character rig here. This is without hair because we don't actually see him in our animation software when we, uh, or we don't see him with hair in our animation software. But you can see the deformations are looking much better in the hips. Um, things aren't pinching in the arms and stuff like that. And you also notice that he has round glasses now. So uh, we had started off with him having square glasses because we we're going to have this idea of him being very, very squared off and, uh, and kind of cubic, I guess, uh, and Sherman being lots of round shapes. And we included that motif in the glasses, but we found that the connection between the two characters wasn't as strong when he had square glasses and Sherman had round glasses. So we gave him the round glasses, and that brought the characters closer together. We figured they both shop at the same lens crafters. So. Uh, one of the other tests that we do early on are these expression tests. And the idea with these is to, again, find out what's working and what's not. So he, we had a number of challenges with Mr. Peabody with his head. One is actually common on both him and Sherman, is they're wearing these glasses with giant rims that are really, really dark and strong. And those rims happen to sit right where you want their eyebrows to sit. So if we kept his eyebrows where they would normally fall comfortably, you could never read his expressions because you'd have these dark lines for the eyebrows connecting to the dark lines of the glasses. And you could see right there where they drop down. Suddenly the expression is a little bit harder to read. You could figure it out, but you have to analyze it. And that's, we don't want to do that. We want a very, very quick, clean graphic read. So we realized, okay, we have to make sure that we lift his eyebrows up above his glasses. But when we do that, there's certain shapes that look appealing and certain shapes that don't. Uh, when things get really, really, really messy and confusing and wavy, those shapes don't work for us. So we use this as a sort of a Bible to say, don't do these shapes, do these shapes. This feels like Mr. Peabody, this doesn't. Uh, the other thing we notice is that when we do need to bring his brows down, we have to do it really fast. Otherwise, it feels like this slow, like, because his head is so long. So we sort of measured like how fast do we have to move his brows so that you don't miss them when they go down really quickly. Um, and then, you know, what, what sort of shapes work when they're low? The other big challenge is the muzzle. In the original show, Mr. Peabody spent a lot of time talking out of the front of his mouth with his corners pushed forward. But we wanted to be able, so we wanted to do that, but we also wanted to be able to pull the smile all the way back across his face. And in 2D, that's easy. You just draw. You're like, done. Yay. And in, anima in 3D animation, that's actually geometry that you have to pull. So if you imagine this like piece of fabric that has fur on it, and there's a little slit in the corner right here, and then you want to pull that over here. As soon as you do this and the fabric just bunches, you get all these wrinkles and all the fur is kind of compressed together. So we had to figure out how in the world we were going to get this corner to be able to come all the way over here and then go all the way back there without the fur bunching up and going crazy. So there was a lot of exploration of that. and We had to find the exact right place to put the corner of the mouth in order to allow us to go like that. What? Not enough? Swahili? What? Not enough? Swahili? So the other thing we looked at was teeth. On the TV show, sometimes he has teeth, sometimes he doesn't. We thought, well, we want to be able to do that too. So we put in controls to say, you know, do we need teeth or do we not? And in this dialogue test, we tried it without teeth. And it works really great when he's talking like this. And he says, what? Not enough? Then as soon as he goes to Swahili, it looks like he's been kicked in the mouth and he's missing all of his teeth. So if you'll what? notice. Not enough? Swahili? What? Not enough? This doesn't work. Swahili? So the animators had the ability to turn the teeth on or off whenever they wanted. And uh, we would do that through quite a bit of the film. The other thing you'll notice is up here at the top of his head, his hair, it, we call the flibbity gibbet, is sticking out facing directly at camera, which looks really bad because graphically we want this to kind of flip up over this way. And if I go back to the previous shot here, you'll notice that in here, every direction he faces, the hair is breaking the silhouette and it looks much more appealing. 
So uh, it's actually modeled to naturally fall off towards screen right when he's facing that way. So what we did was we just added controls to be able to flip it back and forth. And every time Peabody turned this way or this way, the animator would flip the hair and flip the hair. They also grabbed the back flippity gibbet, which is Latin for flippity gibbet, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> On the back of its head. Uh, and we would take that and just slide it all the way around like this. So we were constantly moving things around on his body just to try and make it look good uh, but, graphically. No. Uh, once we started figuring out all these rules, Bryce McGovern, who was the supervising animator and the lead on Mr. Peabody, went in and basically drew up a bunch of rules that we could give to the animators. Because our goal, once we get into full production, is to have an entire group of animators who can animate any character on the film. That's what I would love. By the end of the film, you know, we're going full steam. Everyone's going crazy. You've got tons of shots that are super, super important in order to hit the emotional beats of the character. And I want to have as many people as possible be able to sit down and animate the character effectively. So we come up with all these rules to say, OK, when you're working on Mr. Peabody, the first thing you're going to do is never pose him looking directly at camera. You're always going to turn a little bit. You're going to take the muzzle. You're going to twist it. You're going to lift up the brows. You're going to twist the eyes. You're going to take the head and go like this. And then you're going to take the hair and do that. And then you're going to take the jaw and make sure it does the right thing. Make sure it's on model. If we don't do that, we get a lot of stuff that doesn't look right. So we came up with all these rules about what we needed to do to make sure that it looks like Mr. Peabody and it, his head posing looks really interesting. The mouth was a huge one for us. So you'll notice that with his jaw, we wanted to be able to have him talking out of the front of his mouth. We also wanted to make sure that he could smile. We found that if we just took the jaw and we went and hinged it, it looked like he had a crocodile mouth because it just was this really long, ugly shape like that. So instead, what we did was we added controls to allow us to take the entire jaw and shove it back so that whenever he opened his mouth from the side, we could just pull, pull the whole thing back. And you got this really nice, clean line from the base of the nose all the way down the muzzle in like that into the, into the neck. Never that. We still out allowed controls to do this because if he was facing forward, we wanted to be able to see the jaw. And we'd often have to jut it further forward to make sure that you could see the lower lip when you needed to. So then again, once we had him working, we did a lot of animation tests just to sort of answer questions about, now that we know what he looks like, what does it feel like when he's moving? What feels like Mr. Peabody? This was done by Nettie Asset, who's one of our uh, top animators there. And uh, again, it's on twos, because we don't need to animate it with all the finesse and polish of a final animation. We just want to get in the rough ideas and make sure that this is feeling like him. So we found he feels best when he's standing with his legs together, arm behind nice posture. We also found that he's most engaging and doesn't feel very snooty and smarter than you if he's sitting with his muzzle slightly down. So that was one of the things we did a lot of to make sure that he connected with the audience and didn't feel like he was just, you know, ha ha ha, I'm so smart. I'm a talking dog. Meh. You know, I'm better than you. We would have him like angle his muzzle down. So it's like, yes, he knows he's intelligent, but he's connecting with you. And he's making sure that you realize he doesn't think any less of you because he happens to be incredibly brilliant. This is a real math problem, by the way. Um, and if anyone can figure out what the answer is, there's another bottle of water here in it for you. <laughs> I'll just put that. Any math geniuses? Do you already get your bottle of water. You can't have fun. <laughs> um, so this is, while we were doing all of our animation tests, the next thing we had to do was figure out what he was going to look like with his fur on. So this is an early test of the fur and lighting. Uh, he is a huge challenge because he's a white dog with white fur. And that's very hard to light and make look good and make readable. Um, these are fancy graphics that we use to show executives to show how smart we are and how much we're, <laughs> why it's worth spending the amount of money that we're spending. Uh, no, basically, these go in and, and break down how much time each thing is doing as we're doing our render. Doug can probably tell you more about that. Uh, I think for Kendall and Christoph and I, we look at that and go, oh, yeah, the PBGI, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. That's worth seven minutes. Yeah, sure, I guess. Uh, this is the total time that each of these frames would take. So it's about three and a half to four hours per frame, which is obviously a lot. So we look at this, and then we say, OK, what can we do to simplify? And then also make sure we're getting the look that we want. And when we looked at this, we thought, he looks really dirty, not quite as clean as we want. So uh, we worked a lot on the fur to try and make sure that it felt furry, but it wasn't overwhelmingly furry. You don't want to get, you don't want him looking like a, a plush toy or something. You want him just looking like he's got some fur to him, but um, it's not overwhelming. So we also placed him in various lighting conditions to make sure that he could work in any scene in our shot. This is the 
uh, Koi Pond at DreamWorks down in Glendale. This is another space. I don't know who that guy is. <laughs> but he's looking at Mr. Peabody. <laughs> and now he's upset with him, so he's looking away. <laughs> and then, you know, we do them in lighting scene or in, in night scenes and everything like that. Once we find that we can balance all this stuff, it makes it a lot easier to get into production and be able to have them work in, in any lighting situation. Sherman is my absolute favorite character I've ever worked on on any film ever. He's just such an optimistic person, and he's so appealing and such a joy. Uh, these character designs were done by Tim Lamb, who is our art director, who is a genius. If you ever look him up, just do Tim Lamb, go online. He's got amazing paintings. He's phenomenal. And these were super inspirational for the animation department. Uh, I love the, the drool on the book right there. And there's something about just the way the arm comes out here completely flat with it turned up. And his enthusiasm for playing games is great. Uh, and then this, of course, is amazing. 7.30 a.m. 7.34! Bah! And that totally defines, Mr. Or defines Sherman's personality. He's just chaos. He's completely chaotic. Uh, this was our, uh, we call it our creative rig, our previs rig. And it should be playing. <laughs> there we go. Yep. So again, just testing his proportions. He does have a giant head. It is like his, if, if my, I was Sherman and these were my shoulders, because they are my shoulders, my head would be like that. Like it's gigantic, which is really fun, but created a ton of challenges for us to figure out how to make him move so it didn't look like his head was just going to snap off his body and like roll down the hallway. So like for example, if, if he was standing and he turned his head like that, it would be like <laughs> So we would be like, okay, if he's going to turn like this, we've got to incorporate the entire body. And so we used a lot of pre-production time figuring out how do you have a character with a giant head like that not be, you know, and stuff. Which is how I feel after I've been drinking. Uh, the other thing we tested with our, with our rig was this idea of squash and stretch. And if you look very carefully, you'll notice he's got three legs. <laughs> very special. He's a mutant. Uh, the idea for this was in a lot of old 2D animation, whenever you have a character moving very frenetically, they didn't have motion blur. So they would just throw in extra limbs and eyeballs and smears and stuff like that, which is super fun and exciting and really hard to do in CG because you've got specific geometry that you're rendering. And we've done things like that in the past, but it's been very difficult. We've actually had to send geometry to effects who's going to then duplicate the geometry and get it in and then have to tell lighting about it so they're aware of it so they render it properly. And it's this big process for any shot. And I really wanted to try and do it on the film. So I did this test very quickly show this to Rob, the director, and said, what do you think? Do you think we should do it? And he goes, yeah, it looks pretty good. We should do that. And I went, yes. I'll take that as a we have to do it. The film won't succeed unless we do it, so we're going to do it. So it was great. Um, how many of you have been to some of the other presentations we've been doing, uh, like the, the talk we did yesterday? We talked a lot about collaboration. So you know, I met with Philippe, uh, who is the visual effects supervisor on the show, and I said, you know, Rob is desperate to do this. <laughs> He's really, really got to do it. He's going to be so angry at you if we can't do this. <laughs> you know, how do you think we can do it? What, what do you think? And so we sat down with him and the character TDs and CFX, and we said, OK, what are the challenges with it, and how can we solve it? And we made a system in the rig so that the animator at any point could just turn on up to three extra body parts for each limb. So you have three extra arms here, three extra arms here, three extra legs, three extra legs. And you would just turn those on, and then they would show up and render and composite. So we used it all over the place. We used it for a lot of scrambles. We actually found that we were using it just if a character was moving, and we wanted to modify the motion blur a little bit and make it feel a little bit thicker and really describe the arc a little bit better. We would just add an extra arm kind of like right over there. And it worked really well, and it was fun. So, the one, so we got those things answered. Then we went ahead and made our actual rig. And you'll notice here, actually, we scaled the head down a little bit, and we also thickened his body. He was looking a little too old and gangly in the previous version, so now he's thinner, cuter, or sorry, shorter, fatter, cuter, nerviouser, confidenter, not. <laughs> I have a story about that. I will tell other people later when we're all drinking. Uh, so we did our facial expression test with him as well, and what we found is he's just appealing. He was really easy to get to look nice. The real challenge was just the corners of the mouth to make sure that they didn't hit exactly into the rims of the glasses, but all you had to do to make Sherman feel like Sherman was open up his eyes, lift his eyebrows, and make him smile, take his muzzle, and sort of go like, all right, and it's like, okay, there we go. Um, our big question was how, how many buck teeth do we give him? Like, how much do we do that? 
versus not. And we found that just giving them a little bit felt, felt really nice. Uh, the other thing, actually, that we did with this is one of the challenges we have in, in animation, because our process is, is very linear, where you've got your animators working, and then go also off to lighting, and then the lighting works on the, the sequences for a while. By the time things come out of lighting, it's been quite a long time since you've animated. And once eyeballs are lit, we tend to get shadowing, like in the corners of the eyes and on the outside. And that can tend to make the characters look a little bit cross-eyed sometimes, or a little bit wall-eyed. And, and eye direction is incredibly important, especially now that we're in stereo. Because what happens is you put on stereo glasses, and you see the characters. And if their eyes aren't looking directly at each other, like if I'm talking to someone, you can tell if I'm staring at their ear or if I'm staring in their eyes. Like it's really, and it's just a couple of pixels over. So in 2D, you would, you would, or in, in flat, you know, when you're not doing stereo, you could fake it. But now that we're in stereo, you can't fake it. And the fact that they have glasses, our two main characters have glasses, that makes it even harder because we didn't see the refraction until things would be lit. So we immediately knew that this was going to be a big challenge for us. I didn't want to have to go and animate, send stuff to lighting, and then get everything back to tweak the eye lines all over again. So we actually had a way to put refraction in the glasses inside our animation software. So I could pose Sherman, have him three-quarter, turn on refraction, and see this far eye go like that and pop forward, shape the eye so it looked really good, and then I knew that that was going to be fine going through lighting. Saved us a lot of time. Just another little pre-production animation test. We did a lot of these. They're very fun. Here's his turnaround. Uh, we wanted to keep his texturing relatively simple. We didn't want too many pores or freckles or anything that would be really distracting. We liked this very, very clean and very graphic. Rob Minkoff, who's the director, loves uh, simplicity in the design and in the shapes. So we just really focused on that. This is Zombie Sherman. <laughs> this is the way he came in uh, with before we would open his eyes. So you can see the difference, definitely. Uh, and this is also before we shrunk his head and, and made him a little bit thicker. But you know, just like with Peabody, we put him in different lighting conditions to see how his skin would react. But the movie really is about the two of them. So we, did, we wanted to test the two of them together. This is by Guillermo, one of our other great animators. <laughs> the fun thing is, while we're doing these tests, you discover little nuggets of just joy in these tests. And you go, OK, that we have to figure out how we're going to use that somewhere. And unfortunately, we couldn't use this exact idea. But the way that Sherman's mouth was moving became incredibly appealing and something we, we definitely wanted to do. We also realized that Peabody can, unfortunately, if he's facing too far forward, it could look like he's got two meat patties stuck together for his mouth. So we had to make sure that we would just pull his jaw up so you don't see that bottom lip unless he's talking right here. So a little bit about how we actually go through production. Uh, you guys probably know all of this stuff, but I'll just go through quickly. Everything starts with a story, and then we go into the storyboard process where they sit there and iterate. If you guys have been downstairs, you see an amazing uh, story pitch by Conrad who is phenomenal. If you ever get a chance to actually see, that, that's pretty, probably the closest you'll be to a really great live story pitch for a while. But if you get a chance to go to somebody who is a phenomenal pitcher, it's awesome. Like You just sit there and you're like, this is the funniest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. Like the, just, the energy that they put into it is so phenomenal. So we'll get the story guys going and doing their sequences. Once we have the stories up and running and they look really great, then everything starts flowing through production and it gets very exciting. Um, the, this is a camera, my beautiful keynote camera graphic. Uh, so the camera team, what will happen is as the story is ready to go into production, the uh, director of previs, the production designer, the visual effects supervisor, myself and the director will get together and we'll talk about the sequence and what are the goals of the sequence visually, what are the goals in terms of the acting, what do we want to get, what's not represented in the storyboards, and you know, what's, our, what's our goal moving forward. The previs team will then work on that sequence for about six weeks showing stuff iteratively to the director. And then once it's ready, it'll come over to, oh, sorry, while they're working on that, you've got the background um, and the environments people working on, on getting the environments working. Some of it's going to be matte painting. Some of it will actually be modeled. And then it'll come through to animation, represented by happy face here, because I love my job. And what we'll do is we'll meet with the director as soon as we're ready to start, and we'll have a launch where he says, this is the reason why the sequence is in the film. This, is, this shot is important in this film because of this, and this is the thing that needs to happen in the shot to make it read. Most of the time, they're not going to say, I want specifically this character to pick up this thing with this hand, and he can use these fingers, but keep this finger out, and it's going to be this timing. They don't get into that sort of detail. They just say, this is what the character needs to learn. This is what needs to happen in the shot. 
And then we go off and we figure out the best way to do that. And I'm going to show you one of the ways that we do it in a minute, which is super fun. After we finish, things go to the hair and clothing group. That's CFX, character effects. They do hair, clothing, other sorts of deformations that we can't do in, in the rigs. Uh, they're phenomenal people. And then things go to the effects department, represented by water. And it's sort of tear-shaped because it's so beautiful, it makes me cry. <laughs> and then, this is my keynote animation skills. You ready? Yeah? <laughs> ah, lighting. Fantastic. So uh, then things go into the lighting department. Obviously, these are, you know, things are moving around back and forth. But this is sort of the idea with the linear process as we go through. And then in the end, there's a group called image finaling that goes in and fixes all the stuff that none of us are able to fix along the way, like little pops and texture glitches and geometry growing through each other and things like that. They're amazing. I, they fix stuff that's just like, how did you paint that in stereo? I don't, I don't know how you did that. Um, I want to show you a sequence from the film. This is when Peabody and Sherman and this girl Penny go to get help from Leonardo da Vinci because the way back needs a jump start. Leonardo da Vinci is having a very rough time because his model will not cooperate and he's trying to make a beautiful painting. So I'm going to show you the final version of the sequence and then talk about actually how we created that. Happy body, my old friend! What a welcome interruption! Believe you me, this woman is a make me nuts. So, are you banned? Good to see you. What do you want? We're in a desperate hurry to get home, but the way back needs a jump start and we thought who better than Leonardo da Vinci to help us on our way? Peabody, I would love to help you, but you come at a very bad time. I don't know what I'm going to do with this crazy woman. <laughs> you see what I mean? What seems to be the problem? What is the problem? <laughs> I am halfway done with the painting. She will take a smile. Fine, I a smile. No! That's a fake smile! Everybody knows that! Why don't you make it a real smile? Why don't you say something funny? I paint the paintings. I make the machines. I don't tell the jokes! He doesn't. Okay, so that is the final lit version of that part of the sequence. Before any of the performance gets in there, it goes through previs. And the whole point of previs is really to say this is what the cinematography is going to look like. This is where the characters are. This is what rough lighting is going to be. So I'm going to show you that the previous version of that scene. And remember, it's really just for staging to get the idea across. Happy body, my old friend. What a welcome interruption. Believe you me, this woman is a make me nuts. So, are you banned? Good to see you. What do you want? We're in a desperate hurry to get home, but the way back needs a jump start. And we thought, who better than Leonardo da Vinci to help us on our way? Happy body. I would love to help you, but you come at a very bad time. I don't know what I'm going to do with this crazy woman. <laughs> you see what I mean? What seems to be the problem? What is the problem? <laughs> I am halfway done with the painting. She will take a smile. Fine, I a smile. No, that's a fake smile. Everybody knows that. Why don't you make it a real smile? Why don't you say something funny? I paint the paintings. I make the machines. I don't tell the jokes! So there were a number of challenges in that. The biggest challenge was that whole part where he comes over to Mr. Peabody and he's walking like this past the camera and then he comes down and he crouches and then he and Peabody slide forward while he's crouched. We were trying to figure out how do you make that really engaging and interesting. Um, besides the fact that Peabody's that tall and he's this tall and they've got to be next to each other. So we wanted to explore a lot of ideas about how we could approach that. And the best way for us to explore things is through video reference. Those of you who were downstairs in the exhibit probably saw some of the video reference alongside the shots. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, you're going to see some more of it up here. Um, but definitely go down and check it out. The reason why we use video reference is because animation is ridiculously slow to do. Every animator will animate about three and a half to four seconds of animation per week. So if you imagine, you know, 1001, 1002, 1003, that's 45 hours of work for an animator every week. Um, and we love that because we like to get into all of the crazy detail. But the problem is, is let's say I'm working on a 10 second shot. That's, you know, three and a half, four weeks worth of work. 
And if I'm working on that shot and I go through and I'm animating it and I think it's great and I show it to the director after four weeks or after three weeks and he goes, that's awesome, but he has to walk that way and you should use the other hand and he want, I want him to kind of do this. You're like, oh, yeah, cool. I'll go do that. Okay. So we can't really head the wrong direction. We need to get stuff in front of the director as quick as possible to get feedback. And doing video reference is amazing for that because you can, in a couple hours, get a bunch of ideas up, talk to, talk to other animators about it, get their ideas, and then edit together stuff to show the director and say, is this the direction you want to go? And they can respond really, really quickly to that. And then we can start moving in the right direction. So I'm going to show you the video reference version of that part of the sequence. Most of that is, are we running out of time? Are you just stretching? OK, good. Actually, that, we're doing good. Um, most of the stuff you're going to see in here uh, is uh, by Jason Spencer Galsworthy, who was an animator at Aardman. He's one of our supervising animators. And uh, he also does a lot of improv, so he's a pretty phenomenal actor. Um, he makes a very nice Mona Lisa, as you will see. Uh, and uh, yeah, let's check it out. Oh, the other thing to take a look at is, at some point, he gets really crazy as Leonardo, and he actually flings the headphones off of his head. And if you look carefully in another shot, you can see they're taped on after that. <laughs> Happy body, my old friend. What a welcome interruption. Believe me, you mean this woman is a make me nuts. So, are you banned? Good to see you. What do you want? We're in a desperate hurry to get home, but the way back needs a jump start, and we thought, who better than Leonardo da Vinci to help us on our way? Peabody, I would love to help you, but you come at a very bad time. I don't know what I'm going to do with this crazy woman. <laughs> you see what I mean? What seems to be the problem? What is the problem? <laughs> I am halfway done with the painting. She won't even smile. Fine, I a smile. No! That's a fake smile! Here Everybody knows that! Why don't you make it a real smile? Why don't you say something funny? I paint the paintings. I make the machines. I don't tell the jokes! So, yeah, I, we love, like, this is one of the most fun things to do in dailies, is when all of a sudden you sit down and there's this giant animator, like, on screen, like, ah, you know. We actually had one, uh, a shot on Megamind. How many of you saw Megamind, by the way? Excellent. I love you all. Um, we had a shot on Megamind where Metro Man sort of comes to the realization that uh, everything is always going to be the same. Nothing ever ends. And he's inside the, the dome, and everything's melting above him. And uh, if anyone has their login information, that would be <laughs> great. I don't know why it's over there. But anyway, I'm sure that'll be fixed quickly while I tell you the story. So uh, there's a scene where he's like sitting there, and the camera's from underneath him. And he does this like, and then he takes off flying away, and then has his, his moment of, of contemplation. Jason um, did the video reference for that shot where he's going ah, like that. And we were watching it in our screening room, which is a screen about this size. It's very dark. We're all sitting up close watching. And there's a reference of the camera from underneath him with very nice romantic lighting. And he goes ah. like that over and over again. <laughs> and everyone's watching it going, this is a little too personal. <laughs> and all of a sudden, he realized what we were all witnessing and how uncomfortable it was. And he just burst out laughing. And he's got this am amazing like ah! laugh. And it was like, quick, change it, change it. Um, but anyway, we love doing the video reference. We actually have a video reference room that the animators can book out. It's got a, a I don't know why I'm pointing it to it, because it's down over here. But there is a chest of toys and stuff for us to use. We've got shields and swords and wigs. And you'll see in uh, some video reference later, People get very dressed up and very into it. But basically, we can book out this room and then just act like crazy. There's mats. We'll often bring in other animators to help us out. And it's super, super fun. Uh, and we use it definitely for figuring out what we're going to do with the scene. Now, something I want to point out, this is also from Megamind. This is the scene where Bernard is in the restaurant with Roxanne and accidentally turns into Megamind and doesn't realize it. And so it's all of the people reacting to that. This is Maciek, who's a Polish animator. And he is an amazing a video reference. Um, so he just shot this of all the people reacting. <laughs> this next one is, is my favorite. Oh, no, not this one. I think it's this one. <laughs> he was very upset that I found this video, by the way. <laughs> Um, but I'm showing this because, first of all, you know, you can see that he's trying a whole bunch of different things.
But we don't just take the reference and then copy it. The idea is to understand it and analyze it. So this is a video I found of his breakdown of the video reference to try and understand what's actually happening to his body as he's doing all these actions. So you'll notice over here there's these ground, uh, green circles. Those are the keyframes. So he goes through and he analyzes and he's, he's like, what are the key storytelling poses in the reference that help me understand what the action is? What's actually going on with the timing of the, the nose? And how does that relate to the way the corners of the mouth go up and down? What's the timing with those? When does my face squash and stretch? What's actually happening with my chest? Like when does it actually pull over like that? So we're not just going in and saying, here's the reference. I'm going to copy, pose, 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 pose. There's my animation. We look at the reference and we break it all down and we understand to a deep level of what it is that makes it feel like that. Because we have to translate that to our actual characters. And if we're just copying it, if we can never find the reference, we won't really be able to understand what we need to do to make the characters uh, emote correctly. So I love his, his sort of analysis is always really fascinating to me. OK, so once we've got the reference and the director says, you guys are all geniuses, you're, you're moving in the right direction, that's fantastic, then we go in and we block the shot. And by blocking, it's just like the test I showed you with Peabody where he's up at the board and he's writing. We're not trying to get in all the finesse and polish of the animation. We just want the key poses to help describe the action. I'm just going to show a little bit of this um, because uh, it's the first shot really describes it well with, uh, with Da Vinci. Happy body, my hold of friend. What a welcome interruption. Believe me, you mean this woman is a make me nuts. So, are you banned? Good to see you. What do you want? We're in a desperate hurry to get home, but the way back needs a jump start, and we thought, who better than Leonardo da Vinci to help us on our way? Peabody, I would love to help you, but you come at a very bad time. I don't know what I'm going to do with this crazy woman. So you can see that all the polish and finesse isn't there yet, but you know exactly what's going to happen. And so we can get that in front of the director very quickly and not spend the time being like, okay, each finger is going to be offset beautifully and the timing is going to be great and the spacing is going to look amazing. We get that in front of the director and he gives us notes. We can change it very quickly and then go in after he agrees that this is the blocking he likes. Then we add all the polish and weight and make it look really, really good because that is incredibly time consuming. This is what it looks like when we're done with the animation process before it gets into the lighting and before we do all the simulation of the clothing and stuff like that. Body, my old friend, what a welcome interruption! Believe me, you mean this woman is a make me nuts. So, are you banned? Good to see you. What do you want? We're in a desperate hurry to get home, but the way back needs a jump start, and we thought, who better than Leonardo da Vinci to help us on our way? Peabody, I would love to help you, but you come at a very bad time. I don't know what I'm going to do with this crazy woman. So for me, Da Vinci in, in that, success, more logging in. So in Da Vinci in that, he's all about his hands and fingers and stuff. So that's where we spent all of our time polishing, is making sure that this was really fluid and, and dynamic. And the great thing is, is that we tried to do that just for him, so the other characters were completely different. And we spent a lot of time on each character figuring out what are the specific things about them that make them unique, so that when you watch it, you know immediately that's Da Vinci, and that's Agamemnon, and this is Mona. Um, this is Scott LaFleur, who is one of our animators who's phenomenal at video reference. Uh, he puts himself into his reference an insane amount. And at the end of each show, I like to take all that reference that people have done, edit it together into a compilation reel, and put it to fun music. So, <laughs> so I'm going to show you uh, two minutes of some of the reference that we, was used in the making of the film for Peabody and Sherman, uh, edited to um, the Austin Powers theme song. So, enjoy. Stop. Try. Pause. 